Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. Uh, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Keeping the World Company. And sometimes, you know, uh, keeping the world company makes strange bedfellows. <laughs> so the question before the House is how U.S. aid, and we know finally we got it, will change things in Ukraine. Will it be delivered soon enough? Will it have the necessary effect? This is complex. Uh, and we're going to have a discussion with Tim Apicella, co-host, Gene Rosenfeld, a extremely esteemed person, and Manfred Henningsen, who likes us all and has to work to agree with us. And you'll see, uh, you'll see the level of that agreement today. So we're going to discuss the tortuous route um, of the aid bill for Ukraine and the machinations and delays. And now what's going to happen? It, will the aid get there in time? What kind of aid will come? Is it money? Is it weapons? Where are they coming from? And what effect does that have on the war in Ukraine against Ukraine? What effect does it have on Putin and his um, you know, pu public relations? Uh, what, if, what effect does it have in, uh, on the U.S. where people are uh, uh, protesting against Biden's policies uh, in Israel? It's just It just gets more complicated every single day. So. Um, Tim, give us the scope. What's going on here? What are we looking at? What are the moving parts of this problem? Okay, I thought for a minute you wanted me to ask the previous 11 questions that you presented. Um, I'll just try to best to get the ones that you just said. So, we're, okay, what's the scope? Uh, the scope is Vladimir, excuse me, um, Zelensky will get what he needs immediately. Before the vote even went to the House, I guarantee you that the military supplies, weaponry, was being loaded on those transports, ready for Ukraine. They were already loaded up by the time the Senate got the bill, uh, and that, that, those planes were ready to go. So um, to answer your previous question, um, will they get help in time? Yes, they will. Um, also, remember that for now almost a year, um, Ukrainian pilots are being trained and have been, been uh, being trained in uh, the, I believe the Netherlands and I believe places in um, Germany and uh, Texas uh, on how to fly F-16s. That training probably is very close to completion. Um, Abram tanks that uh, Ukraine said they desperately needed on the battlefield, those are soon to be delivered. Uh, so military help is coming. But uh, remember, this, this bill was passed for $60 billion. I hate to say it, ladies and gentlemen, but... Um, 60 billion isn't that much given this conflict. So what's going to happen after the 60 billion is gone? Uh, if I'm, if I'm um, Zelensky, I, I, I would put in the back of my mind on how do I su settle the boundaries before that 60 billion runs out? Because I'm not guaranteed another round of funding. Mm, good point. Uh, Gene, um, given all of that, What's in Putin's mind? Putin is waiting to see if his asset is going to be reelected president of the United States. But he's not just waiting for that, because the United States and Europe are signaling to Putin that no matter what happens with Ukraine, he is not to take one inch more of Europe. We have been doing joint exercises in the Baltic states uh, with European uh, nations. Europeans have gotten the message that they are going to have to defend themselves, and not depend on United States presidential elections for their support. However, they can't do the job without the United States. We are essential. So um, what's going through Putin's mind is, do I have enough um, mojo to play the long game in, in Ukraine? Can I complete a war of attrition? From what I have read and understood, the Russian army is poorly led, demoralized, um, badly supplied, and has taken four to one casualties to the Ukrainian soldiers. So taking the long view, Russia is 
is running out of steam. So Putin has to figure out how to maintain support for the war, get enough manpower over there, maintain his ammunition supply, and basically hold the line. The Russians haven't really advanced that much in Ukraine, despite all the troubles that Zelensky is at. So the war is at a critical point right now. Both armies are stalemated. The United States Pentagon is signaling to Ukraine that it wants Ukraine to use the supplies to attack in Crimea. This will give, I believe this is their thinking, this will give Ukraine a better basis on which to enter negotiations because what matters to Russia is Crimea. It may talk about Donetsk and Luhansk, but it really doesn't want to lose Crimea. Mm. Manfred, don't, don't you think that some of these weapons are going to change the war? Um, you know, the, the fighter jets it sort of changes things. And some of these missiles are long-range missiles uh, that the U.S. is, is going to give, is giving. Uh, by the way, I read that, uh, that actually Biden had, had moved some of that stuff out even earlier, I mean, weeks ago. Um, so it's, uh, it's sitting in, in Poland, for example, waiting to be delivered to Ukraine right now. Probably has been right now. Um, but, but Manfred, don't you think this changes the war? It's going to be a long-range war. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's all over Russia. It's toward the Black Sea. Um, these weapons that Ukraine's going to get are long-range weapons. So it's not a matter of trench warfare. It's not a matter of holding the line. It's not a matter of dealing with, you know, the tanks that, that come in. And the Ukrainians are really good at blowing up the tanks. Um, it's, it's really a matter of um, firing missiles into the heart of Russia. Uh, don't you think it's going to be a new kind of war now? Well, I think uh, Jean made some very good points uh, about uh, Putin's uh, domestic problems. But I think overall, uh, in response to your question, Jay, I think we are confronted here with uh, different wars. Uh, on the one hand, you could say, uh, the war looks like World War II or even trench war like World War I. On the other hand, you have the cyber war. And uh, the Ukrainian military needs the Patriot rocket on orbit to shoot down planes. Uh, so we are having here uh, two or three different war scenar scenarios taking place at the same time. And for that reason, I think uh, the, uh, the weapons that are delivered now <coughs> come in time, but on the, un on the other hand, uh, it may not be enough, you know, uh, to take care of the drone warfare that uh, Russia has been conducting. So for that reason, you know, I think it will be a long war. It will not be over this year. It, there may be another year, but I don't know who will become uh, self-destroyed first, Russia or the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. It's very you know, pessimistic. Uh, when when uh, the when we looked at Iron Dome in Israel and we tossed it out, um, the Israeli experience of shooting down the 99% of Iran's uh, missiles and rockets and what have you was uh, estimated to be a billion dollars. And, and that, that was expended in a matter of hours, even minutes, um, with the cost of Iron Dome missiles very, very expensive. And so, you know, I take your point, Tim, that you can go through $60 billion in almost no time because of the, the cost of these weapons. It's not cheap. And, uh, you know, as Manfred says, uh, you know, they could run out of weapons soon. So um, I guess the question is, and it goes to the political environment here, is because Trump has said 
that if he if he can get back into office, he's gonna he's gonna end Ukraine or the Ukraine war or Ukraine and the whole thing in one day. Um, which is, should be of some concern to Zelensky because as Trump gets stronger and he looks better, and he does uh, even now with Supreme Court signaling that they're going to put the whole immunity issue on ice, which means the federal charges against Trump are going to get on ice. No trials, no prosecutions, no convictions, no nothing. Um, that he, he may well have you know, greater chances to be president. And on top of that, the people who are protesting around the country against uh, Biden's uh, strategies in Israel are not going to vote for Biden. And arguably, they're going to vote for Trump. So Trump's, you know, potential looks better for a couple of reasons. If he wins, uh, what happens? Well, he changed his. Remember, he changed his mind and supported Mike Johnson's uh, strategy in Congress. So, for that reason, I would not uh, think that he would immediately stop the support for uh, Ukraine if he should become president. I still think he will not become president, and I do not think that the protesters will all abstain or vote for Trump. So I am not as pessimistic in that regard as you are. Uh, Tim? I think within months um, you will see any measurable lack of support for Ukraine. Um, but let me pivot a little bit from that. And this might be a little bit of um, hyperbole on my part about the nature of uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, Vladimir Putin thinks he's the reincarnation of Peter the Great. I don't care if the United States and the EU give $120 billion, $500 billion to Ukraine. Vladimir Putin is not going to allow a defeat in Ukraine. There's just too much national pride. There's too much of his ego at stake. Uh, we may see an escalation of the type of weapons used in the conflict. Um, but at no point is Vladimir Putin going to do an Afghanistan, and that is the pullout. Uh, I don't know why I believe that, but I just do. Um, I think at best, what we may see is the borders of 2014 being settled at, and we may have in a scenario, as we do and have had for almost 75 years, between North Korea and South Korea. You have a heavy buildup on both sides of a, a contrived borderline that's been negotiated to a peace agreement, and um, that's, where it, that's where it ends. Uh, I agree with Gene that Russia is you know, running out of resources, and Zelensky's running out of uh, international support. So the war of attrition can't last for that much longer because it's going to take money, troops, of which both sides are kind of running thin on. So somewhere down the line, there's going to be a negotiated settlement, and I think it's going to look similar to the 2014 border. Wow. So um, you think it's Peter the Great or Nicholas, uh, was it Nicholas II? Who, who was uh, killed? Uh, Ivan the, the Terrible, uh, um, possibly. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just wondering, Gene. Um, you know, Putin is is married to this invasion. His fortunes rise or fall on the success of this invasion. He's not. I agree uh, with Tim. He's not going to let it go very easily. Um, is he really out of gas? Um, will he be able to? parlay his uh, oil revenues into more chain missiles? Uh, will he be able to find more mm, troops out of the prisons or otherwise uh, to, to fight Ukraine, even in the face of increased weaponry by Ukraine? Putin is an authoritarian dictator. He can hang on as long as he has his military behind him and no great significant protest movement. That's not the issue. The issue is how can he extricate himself and still save face? Right now we're at a critical point. It could go either way, depending on variables we don't know the outcome for yet. Europe and the United States need to stay together in opposing Putin in Ukraine. 
Whether or not we can, we will know after the November vote. Europe has got to toe the line with Russia and say not one inch more, no matter what happens with Ukraine. So Europe will do what it can, what it can, as Manfred has so ably expressed many times, to defend Ukraine. That possibly will not be enough. Ukraine, on the other hand, is an incredibly resilient nation. They have undergone genocide, basically, under Stalin and the Great Famine, the Holodomor. They know what they're up against. And in contrast to Gaza, where we know the Israelis are not intending to eradicate the Palestinians, we do know from actual texts we have gotten from Russia and Putin's faction that they will kill any Ukrainian that does not pledge allegiance to Russia. That is genocide. Yeah, that's part of that memo that was leaked, the internal uh, classified memo that leaked out of, the, out, of the, uh, out, of, out of Russia. And so Ukraine is facing life or death. When people face life or death, it's amazing how resilient they can become. But rather than look at extreme case scenarios, I do believe that even Trump will not want to be president on the watch that Ukraine goes completely under. He's also depending on a team of people in the State Department and the national security uh, agencies, particularly uh, Burns at CIA, who he's going to depend upon to, in some sense, allow Ukraine to continue, um, no matter what he says, nothing's going to happen on day one, because Zelensky has a mind of his own, and so do his people. But how much battering Ukraine can take, how much Europe can help without the United States um, uh, support, I don't know. That's all lies in the future. We don't know that. And by the way, they're, Trump is losing support. We, they're not reporting this, but he's losing tons of people. So I, I, I really think that, that he may not be president again. Well, uh, you and Manfred agree on that as a yes. possibility. Man Manfred, uh, let, let's talk about Europe for a minute. You know, Europe was um, very um, supportive early on. And in many ways, it has continued to be supportive. Um, but it, it really hasn't been the crux of the support. Um, and, you know, there have been stories about how Europe is sort of fatigued over this and uh, doesn't, doesn't really care as much as it cared before. I think that's probably worldwide. It's old news already. And the question I put to you is, how does this move in Congress, how does this um, appropriation of 60 plus billion dollars affect governmental opinion, public opinion in the countries in Europe who have supported and, you know, maybe on the fence or more on the fence now uh, in order to support? Are they going to be invigorated in their support? Yes, I think it reinforced the support for the Ukraine. And you have to remember, Europe has paid more to Ukraine than the United States. Paul Krugman uh, wrote an article recently in the New York Times where he pointed out, you know, Europe had uh, supported Ukraine with 100 billion, whereas the U.S. Uh, it did not reach that level of support. But on the other hand, you have Trumpist figures in Europe like Orban of Hungary and you have Slovakia, but I, but strangely enough, people like Meloni and uh, even uh, other conservatives, radical conservatives, are supporting the European uh, support for the Ukraine. Now, in Germany, you have this uh, problem that you have uh, you have not a outright support for Putin, but you have some lingering uh, emotional support within, on the left, going back to the uh, social democratic Ostpolitik. Uh, now, uh, what will happen in the 
elections in June and then in the three state elections in the fall in, in the East German part of uh, Germany uh, will be very interesting. But I do not think that the support for uh, Ukraine will become less uh, important because you have to remember all European countries have been in one way or the other invaded by war. The United States had only two experiences that could be compared with that. One is Pearl Harbor and the other is the 9-11. Uh, so Europeans remember war and the destruction. I mean, uh, for that reason, you have a lot of uh, emotional support for the Palestinians as well. It, because when you see the destructed, the destroyed city uh, in Palestine, uh, in the Gaza Strip, I mean, that reminds Europeans of uh, the bombs that first the Germans dropped, you know, on Warsaw and Rotterdam and Coventry, and then that the Americans and the British, especially the British, uh, dropped, you know, on German cities. So the landscapes that you see uh, on television in, in Europe reminds people of their, uh, well, not Im immediate experiences, but their grandparents and their parents' experiences. So for that reason, you have to, uh, I think, uh, remember that Europe is a continent that experienced war on its territory, whereas the United States uh, didn't since the Civil War. Manfred, some people wonder whether Article 5 will, <clears throat> will be implemented by its terms uh, in the NATO agreement. Um, do you think it is as strong as it was? Is yes. it weaker? Is it stronger now? No, uh, I think will, it is. Will the, other the countries come to the aid of, of a country that has been attacked? Yes, I mean, remember, European countries came to the aid of the United States. Uh, Article 5 was used, uh, and they moved into Afghanistan with the U.S. Uh, Denmark, Germany, all of them, you know, had troops stationed there. They didn't all participate in the war in Iraq uh, because they, Schroeder and Chirac, felt, you know, uh, that the reasons for that war were not uh, as... Uh, clear as the American, as Bush uh, suggested. You know, Tim, we haven't really gotten to the question of, of manpower and woman power, I suppose. Um, there are Ukrainians uh, trying to slip out of Ukraine because they don't want to be drafted into the army. Uh, there is a morale problem. There is a recruitment problem. Um, there is a general fatigue problem. There is a sort of this age thing where, you know, he wanted to go higher, so he recruited people who were older. Now he wants to go lower because he wants to recruit people who are younger. Um, there's only so many people would be available, no matter what the weapons. And then, of course, you have to get to training and commitment and, you know, being part of a military organization. Um, how does that play? You could have a whole ball field full of weapons, but uh, are there enough people? Can Zelensky raise or increase the army to actually deploy those weapons? Oh, I think it's a great question. And again, it's, this is a war of attrition. And at some point, you have to call call it out. Call it out that we're running out of uh, manpower. Um, look, at, look at what they had to do in Russia, and that's recruit convicts out of prison um, as used as cannon fodder. So, yeah, I mean, uh, Zelensky is looking at uh, lowering the draft age from 27 to 25, I believe. Um, remember, during the Vietnam War, um, I believe our draft was at 18. Um, so there's, there's a lot of years there that have a population that could technically be eligible for uh, a Ukrainian draft. Um, so it's, it's a huge problem, and I agree, all the weapons in the world uh, have to be operated by someone. So I don't know what the answer is for uh, Zelensky. And uh, I mean, his troops are battle, they're battle tested, but they're fatigued. You know, you're really not supposed to keep someone in the trenches for over a year because uh, they're just completely exhausted. 
So there needs to be a replenishment uh, of, of personnel. And, and who's to say that a mercenary uh, approach can't be used? Um, uh, Putin mm -hmm. has used it. Mm -hmm. Interesting idea. So, Gene, you know, early on when we started talking about Ukraine here on the program, um, we, we had a bunch of uh, architects and engineers come on, and we interviewed them about what they would do, including a very impressive, I think I, I told you, man, for the German architect, uh, engineer, rather, who told us, um, you know, how Germany rebuilt itself after World War II. Um, and so we talked in the show on a number of occasions about what would be necessary to rebuild Ukraine, make it, you know, a, a thriving industrial civil society again. Because right now, um, you know, a lot of the residential structures have been destroyed, governmental structures have been destroyed, uh, the internet structures have been destroyed, the, the power, the electrical power structures have been destroyed. And most recently, uh, we find that Putin has been targeting businesses and industrial manufacturing facilities. And so the problem that we thought would be, you know, the, you know, the, the one to face a couple of years, well, uh, when this first started, um, uh, hasn't happened yet because it's still a war of attrition. But when it gets to be, hopefully by virtue of these additional weapons and this aid from the U.S., when it gets to be a settlement, a conclusion, an end of some kind, uh, it seems to me that we're going to have a bigger burden than we thought about rebuilding Ukraine, rebuilding, you know, the industrial uh, facilities, the factories, the shops, the shopping centers, the utilities, the residences. Boy, what a job that's going to be. Um, will we be able to handle that? Who will handle that? Who will make Ukraine whole again? Of course. I mean, we're not going to handle it. First of all, there's been talk about the um, the money that has been uh, uh, put aside that, from Russia, that's the frozen assets of Russia, amount to quite a bit of money that would be employed. Secondly, uh, businessmen have been doing deals with Ukraine since the war started. I personally know someone who... Uh, you know, is interested in doing business in Ukraine. So you're going to get a lot of private money in there uh, of businesses that want to uh, restart Ukrainian agriculture, for example, which is amazing, amazing, uh, and uh, other businesses to rebuild infrastructure. It will be a public-private enterprise and uh, quite an opportunistic area for a lot of uh, billionaires to put their money. Whether or not this is good for Ukraine will depend on how corrupt or non-corrupt its government is and how its people view this. But we're getting ahead of the game because history always surprises. That's my favorite mantra. <laughs> Before there's any resolution on Ukraine, we have to be very careful that there is no third world kinetic war. I am not the only historian to see us going down this pathway today. I've been reading some very respected people in the field who believe that we are heading down to a third world war kinetically as well. It may not be as dramatically destructive as it was in Europe and the Pacific in the last war. There are other weapons we can use, like, you know, the uh, hybrid war, the, the cyber war, that are incredibly destructive on a civilian population, by the way. But if we don't understand as a nation that the falling, the, the, the loss of Ukraine, even as only a significant part of Ukraine, now threatens Europe. And if Europe is threatened by Russia, the United States will have to get involved. And we also face on the, in the Pacific what Tim brought up about North and South Korea, because North Korea is now a player. We have a quad of enemies that have developed. We have Iran, North Korea, China, and Russia. I don't know how solid that 
quote unquote alliance is. But we need to test it on all fronts. And we're trying to send signals to China right now. And we're sending signals to Russia through this joint exercise, military exercise in the Baltics with the Europeans. Do not go down this global path to war. Okay, I think it's time for a uh, wrap up. Uh, Manfred, why don't you go first and see if you can uh, address the, the possibility that Gene raised, among other things, namely that this, is, this signals a, a world war. Um, maybe it's early and maybe it's not too early, but uh, perhaps all these threads put together give you what amounts to a world war in different format, but nevertheless a world war. Uh, what are your thoughts and what is your summary of today's discussion? Well, I think uh, we are living in a very dangerous uh, period, but I'm not as apocalyptic, apocalyptic as Gene is. Uh, so I don't think we are threatened with an immediate uh, World War Three scenario. But I would like come back. Uh, would like to come back to your earlier question to her and her answer. What will happen to the destructed, the destroyed? Uh, infrastructure of the Ukraine. I think you have a good model, uh, and that was uh, the Marshall Plan in 1945. But you have to remember uh, that the money, the three major recipients of Marshall Plan money were Great Britain, France, and third, in the third place was Germany. Now, the Americans, the American money helped also to boost the American economy uh, because a lot of that money did not leave uh, the United States, but uh, was used in order to buy all kinds of equipment and material in the U.S. for the reconstruction, you know, of especially Germany, but uh, parts of uh, or other parts of Europe as well. And I think that will happen with Ukraine. You will get a European Marshall Plan. Uh, it will be financed by governments, but uh, the construction, the reconstruction itself, will certainly be will be carried out by private uh, enterprises. So I'm not that uh, concerned about the reconstruction of. Uh, and the payment for the reconstruction of the Ukraine. I think that will be taken care of because Europeans have done that before. But I'm concerned about people like Orban and the Slovakian uh, president uh, or prime minister, that they will find uh, an audience in other countries. So far, that has not happened. So far, I think uh, Europe is solidly uh, behind uh, the Ukraine. Okay, let me, let me move to Tim because we're running out of time. Tim, your, your final thoughts, and maybe you could address one thing, and that is, um, you know, yesterday on your show, we, we talked about um, exactly uh, what happened with Johnson. Um, and there was an article, I think, in the Washington Post today, which uh, said it was just a matter of Biden going to Johnson and explaining and bringing all the intelligence guys in and just, um, you know, advocating with him. And, and they changed his mind. Uh, which is to everyone's credit, if that's the way it went. But this article took that position. There was nothing under the hood. It was just that. But my question to you, uh, I would appreciate if you would address, is, is that, um, gee whiz, this could happen again. Um, as we discussed, 60 billion may not go that far. We may have to go to Congress again. Biden may have to ask them for more money between now and November. Let's not even talk about what happens after that. Um, will is Congress in a different place now? Is Johnson in a different place where, if the need arises, we could count on them for more money? What do you think? Uh, they're certainly in a better place as far as understanding and the arguments presented. And I go to Gene's point is that uh, you know there's a quad of countries that uh, may well benefit from apathy: um, North Korea, China, Russia, Iran. Um, so I think there's a greater understanding with some uh, decision makers in Washington, D.C. on that point. Uh, there's no guarantees that a, a, another funding package would sail through, could be uh, in a quagmire for six months 
or longer. Um, again, it depends on how far uh, Ukraine and Russia drain their, their resources in the next uh, upcoming seven months, eight months. So I don't have an answer on that, to be honest with you. And then as far as my final thoughts, um, I'm not a big fan of Ronald Reagan as far as his economic policies, but I, I fully stood behind his policy about peace through strength. Uh, you, you make it so unpalatable <clears throat> that victory will cost so dearly, and ultimately no one wins the war or a war of attrition or certainly a nuclear um, you know, uh, conflict. Even if it's a limited nuclear conflict, no one wins that. Um, but that philosophy in my, in my world uh, prevails over the, those that are tried to appease a dictator, uh, a would-be world r ruler, uh, like Neville Chamberlain's philosophy, trying to appease Herr Hitler, thinking that he'll, he'll stop. He'll stop his uh, aggression if we just appease him. Um, that has never worked, I don't think, and it certainly didn't work uh, in World War before World War II occurred. Being your final thoughts, and I, my reaction to ask you is, uh, gee, we've got a lot of trouble going on in the world. We have the Quad, and we have contention all over the place. We have the possibility of a Third World War. Uh, we have people dying and atrocities happening left and right. Uh, what about climate change? Well. Well, That's a left ball curve question. <laughs> it is, it is. Let me just say that um, climate change is proceeding apace. It's on the back pages. It should be on the front pages because it is a much bigger threat. And once it becomes um, a critical threat, which it could become an irreversible threat, um, all the problems we're discussing here today will be moot. And there will have to be other ways in which countries come together. We, we're still, you know, we're still going into space with Russian cosmonauts. Um, we do have the capacity to transcend our conflicts, no matter how terrible. And as I said before, the leaders of the major states today that are confronting one another they're phasing out too. They may have 10 more years in them if they're lucky, but that's it. So how long you know, do you have for 10 years? We you know, you know what, you're, what you're saying is uh, let's, let's hope the, the, the next generation will see this all more clearly and, and put the priorities in the right sequence. But when I look, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, everybody. When I look at the college campuses in this country, I do not feel that generation is going to save us. I'm sorry. Anyway, okay, thank you very much, Dean Rosenfeld. Uh, thank you, Manfred Henningsen. Thank you, co-host Tim Apicella. It's been a very interesting discussion, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Aloha. want to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.